Good afternoon, everybody. This is the time to wake up again. And I really want to thank Michael and David for being the warm-up band here. This is the main act. Before I start, I would like you to hit uh, GitHub like this. If you're here, you read the abstract, you downloaded Dr. Racket, you're ready to win a prize. Realm of Racket, signed by the, oh, one of the authors. There are 13 more to collect after that. Okay, and the way to get that is to install a little package in your Dr. Racket. You do that by going to the File menu. You say Install Package, and you type S, as in strange loop, L, as in loop, 2014. The 4 is so that you listen. It's not 5, it's 4. And then hit, hit. Okay, everybody listening? And hit Install, and you're ready to go, okay? So, uh, Mike and David said Big Bang in 1930. It was actually 1926 or 7 when uh, Gödel was visiting Princeton and Alonso came up with Lambda Calculus. It took 13 years to publish. This day we take 13 minutes to publish an idea that we had in the future, right? Uh, something like that. So, uh, I want you to imagine the worst. Think ahead. Think a bit more ahead. Imagine your children in middle school. It's one of the worst thoughts you can have. I'm through that. Some of you are up for that, right? Okay. So, they just about figured out 1 plus 1 equals 2. Now they're hitting them with questions like, hey, if x is 5 and y is 3, what's x times y plus 8? Or they're telling them a horse buggy is leaving St. Louis now at 5 miles an hour, going to Chicago. When is it going to get there? Or how far is it going to be from here? until X hours from now, right? And that's how we drone out on children, have been doing it for 100 years, maybe 150 years in American schools, everywhere in the world, and all we get out of that is boredom. It's about numbers, who cares about numbers? Why don't we use pictures and animations? That's the starting point for Big Bang. It was 1995 when I collected my research group and we said, we can do better. We should be able to turn this math into something that works on computers. Okay. Well, so to start with, you have an arithmetic of images instead of an arithmetic of numbers. Why don't we add a green circle and a brown rectangle, different kind of add than one plus one. What do you get? You get a little tree. Well, suppose you have X is a horse buggy, and Y is a white background with a tree on it. What happens if you put the horse buggy at 0, 100? Well, you guessed it. You get a horse buggy on the white background. What if we change this word problem a little bit about the horse buggy going from St. Louis to Chicago and say, don't bother with computing this stuff, but Draw the picture, right? Draw a table of where is it at 10, where is it 50, where is it 120? Why would we do that? Because if we put all those things together, we can ask them to come up with this kind of function. It's called a variable expression technically in middle school. As a middle school teacher, I apologize for abusing the terminology. But that's what they really ask for. Given t, place the horse buggy at five times t, five miles an hour, remember, in this white background, which represents the distance between St. Louis and Chicago. And what you get is a whole bunch of pictures. And you guessed it, if you play this very quickly, you've got an animation, right? So you can easily turn those problem sets into something we, in this audience, can turn these problem sets from middle school into something that goes for an animation as opposed to boring little calculations with numbers. So back to 1995. 
What did we really try to accomplish? The idea was to combine mathematical subjects, like math, or in high school, maybe physics, with programming. And so that programming would help the mathematical disciplines, and mathematical disciplines would help programming. There's a back and forth. There's a synthesis between the two of them. What I don't care about is programming per se. I want to repeat that. I don't care about programming per se. I think it is a mistake of all of us to think that we need to teach programming. We should teach something so that kids who walk away from there, from this middle school, never program again, but become doctors and journalists and artists, take something out of that thing, that synthesis of math and programming. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, here's the bottom line. I mean bottom line, as in money. There's a study, a longitudinal study by the US DOED, Department of Education, that predicts if you understand the concept of function, under all other circumstances equal, your income will be higher at 30. Right? You, your understanding of the concept of function middle school predicts your income at 30. The bottom line, I said so, right? So, my dream was, and what, I've what we've accomplished with this whole research, big research team that we have here, is a very smooth curve. Well, what could that curve mean? The curve means you start at middle school with a curriculum that synthesizes this mathy, programming kind of stuff. You move on gradually, very gradually, into high school, with a program called Teach Scheme. You move up to the first year in college. It's a curriculum called How to Sum Programs. And you can take this all the way to a junior level course in software development. And in this day and age, we actually conduct research on this stuff. Uh, we have pushed this to the point where we write, with middle school software, we write DNS proxy servers. OK, that's possible. So that, that is approximately what I want to show you. What I'm going to show you precisely is how to program in that world. Here is what I don't have time for today. I don't have time to show you how to teach that stuff. I don't have time to show you that with all this work comes the discipline of explicit systematic program design. I don't have time to explain to you how explicit systematic program design helps problem solving in the area of a surgeon, a journalist, an artist, a poet. Okay. I don't have time to explain the teaching languages to you. I'll just show you the stuff. I don't have time to show you the IDE that we made, simple, so simple that middle school kids can use them. Okay. So that's what I'm not talking about. So we aren't just going to the programming. So I'm going to start with a little demo. Gives you an idea how one and one is added in our world. Is that? Is that font big enough up, to, up in the top? Thank you. So one and one, you add it just like in middle school. How do you get pictures? Circle, 60, solid, green, oops. Right, rectangles. We make it. 10, say, and 50, and you make a brown one. And what, guess what? If you put this above each other, uh, So I made a green tree, completely green, eco-friendly, right? Of course, you can also do other things on these things. You can actually insert a picture directly into, oops, I'm going to do this differently. You can directly insert images into the IDE because images are values. That's not, not modern. That's 1995, right? So you have a horse cart, a horse buggy, you ride in the thing, 
And as you already see, you can name values. Naming is just like what they call a variable expression when they say, if x is 5. Well, we can say, if top stands for circle 70 solid green, and stem stands for that, and tree stands for that, and we get exactly what we would like. We can, for example, say tree, or we can say car, or we can give you, oops, a scene with a tree or a scene with a car. You can also write functions in this world. This function down here says, give me a time t. I will place the card at 5 times t and 55 height to the right and top that's a location place, into a scene with a tree. Now kids can actually, instead of using a TI calculator to calculate with numbers, they can say things like, render at 102, and you get the tree. Or render at 55, and you get another scene. Or you can say, animate this function. What does animate do? It plays it very quickly. It does the function starts at zero and just keeps going. What do you think is going to happen? Anybody? This is a pop quiz. What's going to happen when I hit return? The card's going to move, right? And we did nothing else. We literally moved. We did nothing else in these calculations but high school pre-algebra, middle school pre-algebra. That's exact material, eighth grade. And we, that's what we teach, and other things, actually games too, and we'll see this in a moment, in this world of mathematics. Oops. Let me. Come on. Let me go back to my talk. So how do you explain, how do you explain this thing when you get to high school. What we invented, what we really invented, is what I call a functional system of I.O. No more nats required. Okay? Big Bang is a new language construct in which you describe worlds. So this is how you write it down. Just kidding. This is what it feels like. Big Bang we tell the kids in a programming course, is the representation of a little operating system. What do little operating systems do for you? They deal with events that happen. For example, oops, uh, they deal with a clock tick over there, or a gamepad over there, or a mouse up there. And I even had in a brainwave reader, but when I demoed it, I couldn't get any activity, so I didn't do that. What I skipped was this little green circle there. This is a secret. It's not a secret. It's a value that we give the mini OS at, to safeguard. One value at the beginning. Safeguard that thing. Okay? So what happens when the clock ticks? When the clock ticks, Big Bang hands over that little green value to the clock tick handler, a function that takes these kind of values. And it can do anything it wants and compute with this value. And when it's done, that handler hands it back to Big Bang. And now you're kind of done, except that there's this purple thing on the left, your left, right, that thing. And I haven't talked about it yet. Well, every time one of those event handlers, deals with an event, you get to see that green thing move into this renderer, an externalizer. It also does whatever it wants with that green value, and out pops a picture, for example. We could externalize in different ways, like sounds, taste. This is what it looks like in text. That value that you hand over is right there. We call this the state. 
but it's just a value. It could be five. It could be the color green. It could be an image. Could any value in the world that you can think of, you can put there. And then you have a bunch of clauses where you describe the world that you wish to create. We call these things worlds. Let's create a world. You can put in a lot of clauses. The only one that's really required is the purple one that says to draw. And what these signatures tell you is that these handlers and renderers take a state, something of type state, and give you something back. No effects, none. Okay? So to draw is a function that it will take a function that takes a state to an image. Uh, a tick handler takes one state and gives a state back. For example, you might want to run a clock. You might want to simulate a clock. You give it five, one time tick goes away, you get six back. Uh, on key, you also have to give information about the keys. On, on, on a mouse click, you want to say where the mouse event happened and describe the mouse event. And you can imagine many, many more handlers. The yellow one is a, another optional idea is you can say, let's close the world down when certain conditions hold. Okay? So this is the idea. Let's demo that. I wanted to explain animate. What does animate do? Oops. Animate says, start counting at some time. I parameterize the function wardle, which simulates this little trip from St. Louis to Chicago. And I say, every time the clock ticks, I have a function that adds one to the number I, gi I give myself here. So for example, if x0 is 5, the clock ticks at 1, puts a 6 out, brings it back, Big Bang now controls a 6. Before it does anything else, it hands over that number to the function render. And then you can run this thing just like animate. Oops. So let's waddle from St. Louis to Chicago starting at 10. And you saw the horse buggy at 10 comes over. Now we've explained animate. This explanation is, of course, exists because we want to show students more than little animations. We want to show how to, for example, edit little text boxes. Why don't we create a text box? Let me show you first a little bit about strings. Hello, strange loop. All right. That's called a string. You've seen that kind of thing. I can make a big text out of that, like a 222 purple-sized text. That's an image. Okay. I can, of course, string a pen. And in our world, we were very explicit about one kind of things we add. Oops. And I would say, no way, hello, strange world. OK. Now I can explain to you what these little functions do. Here you see another Big Bang function. It takes an S0, which we now say is a string. And so the state that it keeps track of is always a string. When you press a key, I will append that key to the end. All I have to do now is I have to display every time the clock ticks or every time anything else happens, I have to display that hidden string from Big Bang onto the screen. That's the function down there. And it uses nothing else but what we have seen before. Plays an image here and there. You can run that. And you can edit. Well, maybe you can edit. Well, nothing happened. What's going on here? Ah, you can type. That's good news. 
Let's shift up. That doesn't go well, right? What's going on here? Let's start with nothing. I want to say hello, capital letters, of course. Hello, strange loop. And I get two shifts. What's going on? It's a raw editor. It just appends keystrokes. I have to give you one more thing, another idea that you get at that level in school. In ninth grade, and that's our first big success in 1995, fall of 1995, is conditional functions. We use that program, something like that, in a school for <coughs> football players. This is Texas, right? So they have to repeat algebra from in 11th grade from 7th grade. And they didn't know what a sine function could do. And our first teacher who brought this goes, it's a conditional function. What could that be? It's that kind of thing. Now imagine if you can demonstrate that thing with an actual conditional in the real world. What we do now is we are going to replace string append, plain string append, with a new function called shift. OK. And that shift OK function down here is a conditional function. This one has only two classes. The key is recognized as shift. Don't do anything. Just let the next letter go through. Okay. Then you see string append as before. So you get the text. Big Bang hands over the text. It hands over the keystroke information, which is just a string of one letter. And you append that. Shift, hell, oops. Shift, hello world. Well, I still can't delete things yet. That's not good. We should be able to delete things too, right? Whoops. And you can delete things by putting in a function edit. Edit. is a three branch conditional function. You still see the shift key part, but you now see the wrap out key. Wrap out keys say take the last bit away. The last delete last, of course, is also conditional because if there is nothing in the string, you don't want to delete anything, right? You can run that. Oops. Text box, hello. Oh, oh, and we delete it. We have a 10 line program, and kids can now understand how a text box works. It's very different, of course. You can just give them a text box in the editor, but that's no good. Really, they won't understand. So, uh, I have added one more thing. Namely, a mouse event. One line addition. What do you think that does? Pop quiz. I give you the current text. I give you where the mouse event happened, this x and y coordinate. I give you a description of the mouse event. What are you going to see if I move the mouse over my text editor? A blank. Let's try that out. This is important for your, for your, for your price, if you want to print, win, your, win your prize, right? Oops. And there we go, it goes away. Okay? So these things that you, you can very easily, Big Bang distills everything down to its, it is essentials. It's completely functional, integrates with mathematics, and gives you complete 
explanations of what things are. The universe, from Big Bang you go to worlds, from worlds you go to universes. When each kid has a world running on his or her computer, they're bored still. Because kids want Snapchat, or at least text to each other. Why don't we explain texting to each other in the same way? So in addition to functional I.O., no monads, no schmonads, I will give you a way of communicating between worlds, having an actual universe with worlds floating around everywhere. So I didn't tell you the whole truth, because Big Bang can really be introduced in little slices, step by step. There's more to Big Bang than I told you. The yellow stuff is the new part of Big Bang. Take example for ex the example on tick. You now see a signature that says state to state and possibly a message. Where does this message go? Well, you see a whole new clause at the bottom called register. I can give this world a description of another world in the form of an IP address. And then every message that comes out of one of those handlers, if there is one, goes to that place. So somewhere out there on that machine, there is another OS that these kids write that takes care of these messages. And for example, it redistributes these messages, so messages can also come into a world, which is why we have one more line, on receive. You get the current state. You get the message that arrived, and you do whatever you want. You give back a state, or maybe a state and a message. So what sits in the center of the universe? Of course, a server. And a server is exactly a mini OS. It's just a specialized world, Big Bang world, that takes care of messages. And it does so with a little value that it keeps track of. We can put anything there. Usually it's a list of representations of all the worlds that float around in my universe. There are handlers. For example, I can get a new world may show up and say, I want to register with you. And then we do something with the current state, a representation of that world, and we come back with a bundle. On messages, of course, a hand that it takes care of when a message arrives in the central place, it takes the world that sent out this message, the message, and also returns a bundle. So what's a bundle? Bundle is a bit of a mouthful, and we certainly should be able to do better someday. But it combines the state that we want next with a list of mail messages, and the rest is irrelevant for our little presentation here. What's the mail message? A mail message is a place where the message is supposed to go, a world, combined with a message. All right? It's time to demo again. I added two lines to the previous program, two lines. The first one says, so second one says, when I want to register with local host. That's of course me. So they have a constant sitting there so they can run these little distributed programs and test them on their own local computer. And they have one handler on receive that says lambda, and you all know lambda by now, old state and the message. And what I return is just the message. So clearly, the arrival of a message wipes out what you had typed into your text box there. Otherwise, text box stays the same. So we still have about 15 lines of code in here. Let me show you the central thing. This is the entire echo server. It will just broadcast any message that a high school student sends in to all the other guys that are out there. 
And how does it do that? You see, echo is a function. Ignore the argument. It has an empty list sitting there. There's nothing happening yet. That's our secret value for the mini OS. And then we say, when a new world shows up on new, we add this world. It's a function. It's down here. And when a message comes in, we broadcast that message. So how are these functions working out, right? At world takes the current state of the universe, u0, and the new world. And all we do is we add the new world to the list of worlds. Otherwise, we do nothing. And that's the bundle we give back to the universe, the server. Broadcast, it takes the state of the universe, the sender, and the message. Okay? And then it makes a bundle. It keeps the state around because there's no new world. We don't want to throw a world out. We might. Maybe we have only one way of sending mail, and you could do something different. But otherwise, we say map over this universe and create a mail that goes to each of those worlds with the current message. That's a little map thing, and you've seen that in your favorite language. Nothing else happens. How do you do that? So this, load, this module also loads the text box. And I can now launch these worlds. I'm doing three worlds. One will show A, another one will show B, the third one will show C. And then I can edit, and hopefully things show up everywhere else. You see the A world. You see the B world. Oops. Uh, the B world and the C world. And over here, there's a little window that tells me what message is going back and forth. The so students can see what's actually happening. So now I can go in here, and I type in 1, 2, 3, and I get 1, 2, 3. I go to the other world. I don't like 1, 2, 3. I say hello. And I see hello as a word. And the last one can say something too. And say goodbye. OK. And I kill this off, and you'll see the console tells me the universe is going down, and we're ready. We are ready for a little competition. The box office opens up, and I would like you, if you would like to participate, oops, to launch your Dr. Racket. Nobody? Open up your laptops. One person, come on, open your laptops, install this teach bag, I mean, install the package. This is a live demo. Nobody else with the guts here to give you a live demo, as far as I know. I'm going to fail. But at least I try, right? OK. What you will do in your, in your Dr. Racket window, you will type in this, require SL2014. Remember, the four is to test whether you're listening. Then you say, speak, hello, strange loop, or anything else that's long enough, 10 characters. I'm insisting that you count to 10. And then they give an IP address. The IP address is antarctica.ccs.nu.edu. And it's in quoted string. That's not that's it, OK? And when you run that, oh, I got a stray right what? Thank you. OK, so I'm going to register myself. You see, it disappeared because the mouse is there. So you have to type something. And I'll tell you now what you have to type. Take your name tag. On the bottom right, there's a four-digit number. Type in that number. The fourth caller will get a signed book that says, to the proud winner of Strange Loop 2015. Ready? Go. You have to hit return. That's the only change I made to the program. 
I'm going to try two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oops, thanks. If you see thanks, you're done. You can no longer do anything. OK, anybody trying? I don't hear any responses. Louder! OK, that's all. Oh, man, you don't make much noise. OK, I set the fourth caller, and the fourth caller has the number. Where is it? Four. Zero, six, six, eight. All right, coming up. Bring it down. <laughs> All right. I have. That's it for demos. So what I showed you now, up to this point, is approximately what I have been working through from sixth, seventh grade. And, and we actually use a specialized Big Bang there. It's called GamePad. The kids have a narrative, they have worksheets. And after about eight, or we, uh, eight weeks or so, they have a full-fledged game a uh, little video game, people jumping all over the place, stuff like that, you know, 1980s style. Uh, in high school, we have had a couple of courageous teachers who actually did use the connected world, but in, in, in the college course, in the freshman course I taught last time, we certainly did this. And they had a ball that implemented the last game in the book that he's bringing back later. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, what we did from there a couple of years ago, we started with this idea of we could actually push this further. Remember this picture? There's all these worlds out there, and then there's a network that connects this special room. We see this pattern over and over, even in Erlang, our underground language that Mike and David presented before and skipped over other interesting languages. <laughs> did you notice that? Come on. So the idea that we had was maybe we could actually scale this up. We could build real systems in a completely functional manner, in a completely functional manner. And what we, the, the key idea was to fold that blue thing, to make this blue thing an actual part of the programming language. Okay? And then you have worlds sitting inside this all on top of this blue thing, and they can talk to this blue thing. What they, the way they talk is kind of like what Peter showed you in the first keynote. You hand out assertions, and you make assertions about assertions, and assertions about assertions that make assertions about assertions. Do you get that three levels? Okay. And you can go on. And what you get from that is publish, subscribe in a very, very different way. You can also nest these things. So if you think of these yellow guys as functional actors that are launched when certain assertions about assertions are interesting to them, you can also have a network inside, and nobody knows that this actor isn't just a plain actor. It's a network of actors again. Another idea you can do, you can nest it arbitrarily deep. Turtles all the way up. Usually it's down, but you know, the slide goes up. Right. Well, what do you get from that? We get a whole bunch of things, but before I go there, I want to show you what you can do with it. Well, hopefully, we haven't done it yet, but we are about to. You can, for example, replace one network and have actors in different languages sitting there. One actor could be in Python, functional Python. Oh, uh, sorry. A good language, closure, something like that. Another one could be a racket. We could, be, we could even imagine some, some Haskell kind of thingy, right? Or another, another network could be replaced with a multi-core network. And you run this on top of the LAN, and that on top of a wide area network. Oops, sorry. And all of this can be done within the language, and it can slowly be cut down into pieces. 
What we, what we have gotten so far, and we've explored this world quite a bit with an SSH server and DNS proxy server, uh, you know, a chat server, these kind of things. What you get is the, a, a completely different world of coordinated, concurrent groups of functional actors. And from that, we get scope conversations. Each of those groups can talk its language. Of course, we have hierarchies of those conversations. One thing you get, you get resource allocation. Oops. When one of those actors joins, we allocate the resources. When one of those actors fails, we remove the resources. Each level can be tuned to the level in the protocol. If you have 10 levels in your protocol, 10 headers, you have 10 levels. Each talks the level that corresponds to one header. Everything becomes a completely natural design. Okay. And now I'm going to put words into the mouth of a man who's actually doing that. Where's Tony? Well, he's here. And if you see him, you can ask him about all these things because he's built all these things and he's here to talk about it with anybody who wants to talk about it. Okay? So that's Tony Garnock Jones, and he's somewhere in the audience. Uh, and he is part of the stuff, part of the people who built, he's the lead part of the people who built the last few steps we saw now. I want to leave you with a little takeaway that's not researchy, that was just a bit of an illusion that you can do research, you can do work that does good in middle schools, and you can push it all the way to research. Isn't it amazing? But what I, want, what I want to leave you with is this image. We are, this group, I'm, not, I'm just here as the, as the guy who is the oldest in the group. I'm closest to death. That's why I'm allowed to talk here, OK? Uh, but there's a whole group of like 10, 20 people who work in this all the time. We are the first ones ever to have built a completely smooth curve of programming that starts with 10 little six year old, sixth graders and goes all the way to the junior course in college in a completely smooth manner. It's completely thought out. It comes with a whole bunch of baggage that is not just programming, but how to design them systematically, how to make the sign explicit, and how to have an IDE that grows with you from the tender young age to the age when you're ready to join the workforce. That's what I had to say. Thank you very much for listening. This is the end.